Please turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Mark 16, 1 through 8. Well, <laughs> today's the day we celebrate the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And oh, what a day it is. The resurrection of Christ is the chief event in human history. It's the cornerstone of the Christian faith. And everything that we are, everything that we have, everything that we hope to be as believers stands on the reality of the resurrection of Christ. One says that if you remove the resurrection of Jesus Christ from Christianity, you don't have Christianity. And that's absolutely right. The resurrection of Christ is indeed the greatest event in the history of the world. And it's central to everything that we are as believers. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul shows this fact to us by discussing what it would be like if Christ didn't rise from the dead. Result, eternal disaster and eternal ruin. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, then preaching Christ would be senseless, faith in Christ would be useless, all the witnesses and preachers of the resurrection throughout history would be liars, no one would be redeemed from their sin, all former believers who have perished they're in hell right now if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. And then finally, Paul says, Christians would be the most pitiable people on the earth if Jesus is still dead in that tomb. Why? Because if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then our Savior is dead. And if our Savior is dead, then everything that we believe is a lie. You think the resurrection of Christ is kind of important? Right? Right? Good news our Savior is alive and well. As J.I. Packer said, the victim of Calvary is now loose and at large. Amen. And our hopes are made certain. And what Jesus did for all who believe on the cross is a reality. And we have a real reason to celebrate today. Oh, yes, we do. And Mark shows this fact to us. So with that said, let's find out what happened on this Sunday. This Sunday, nearly 2,000 years ago, verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? Now, we're going to stop here for now. And here we see the first event of resurrection morning, which is this, that some women came to anoint Christ's body. Remember, Friday late afternoon was when Jesus died that brutal and horrible death on the cross. Not long after that, his body was quickly anointed for burial by Joseph and Nicodemus. He was then put into the tomb, and the tomb was then sealed. Friday evening came, and the Sabbath began, and all the disciples felt at that point was pain and loss, despondency, despair, and absolute heartache. Of course, that's what they felt. I mean, Friday evening couldn't have been easy for them. And I'm sure that many painful tears were shed by all who loved the Lord. It was a truly wretched night for them. Saturday came and went, and again, it had to have been an absolutely horrible day for the followers of Christ. I mean, Christ was dead, you see. He was dead. They put their hope in him. They left everything to follow him. They believed in him, and now he's in the tomb. They had to have been in a daze as the day came and went and as they contemplated their lives without the Lord. Think of that. Saturday evening came and while the women were going to go and anoint the body of Christ in the morning to finish the anointing that had been done quickly the day before, the thought of doing that to the dead decaying body of Christ on Sunday morning, that had to have absolutely sickened them. Yeah, they were still going to do it because they loved the Lord, but it wasn't going to be easy for them in any way. Now, we don't know for sure what Saturday was like. We can only speculate, but we do know how Sunday began. How? With these certain women rising early and coming to anoint Christ's body. Note that it's now the third day that Jesus has been in the grave. Oh, yes, it's really been about 36 hours, a day and a half, but the Jewish people reckoned a part of a day to be the same as a whole day. And so, according to the Jewish people, Jesus was in the tomb for three days, part of Friday, all of Saturday, and part of Sunday. So the Sabbath is now passed. It's now very early in the morning on the first day of the week. See, this is really the first opportunity that they have to anoint Christ's body properly after the Sabbath and while it was light out. 
And while they started out for the tomb when it was still dark, by the time that they arrived, the sun was beginning to rise. So here come these women making their way to the tomb of Christ. Who were these women? Mary Magdalene was one of them, the woman who had seven demons cast out of her. She was a very faithful follower of the Lord. They also have Mary, the mother of James, who was also the mother of Joseph, who many believe was the sister-in-law of Mary, Jesus' mother. Mark also mentions a woman named Salome. Salome was the mother of James and John, who was in the inner circle of Jesus. It also seems that Salome was Jesus' mother's sister. And then from other accounts, it seems clear that there were other women who were here as well. See, these women uh, had been following Christ for a long time, for a couple of years at least. They followed him up in Galilee, and then they followed him down south to Jerusalem, where they were now at. And they did whatever they could to minister to Christ and to his other disciples. They have been with him, see. They watched his death, verse 40. They, they watched his burial. They saw how Joseph of Aramea, Arimathea took Jesus off that cro cross and wrapped him up and quickly anointed him and laid him in that tomb and rolled that massive stone against the entrance of the tomb. They knew where his body had been buried. They had seen it all because they were there, because they loved Christ. And now on Sunday, they come back to finish what Joseph had started. See, they're going to put more of the spices on Christ's body as an act of love, but also sir, to serve as a preservative for the body. And please note that the resurrection was the farthest thing from their minds. The farthest thing. Now, they didn't come to see the risen Lord. No way. They came to anoint a dead corpse. Matthew tells us that on Saturday, some guards had been placed at the tomb and then a Roman seal was glued to the tomb itself to ensure that no one would come and steal away the body and claim a resurrection as the Jews had feared. But it seems that the women didn't know about the guards and clearly they definitely weren't thinking about Jesus rising from the dead. So they got up early while it was still dark. They gathered their spices together and then they made their way through the streets of Jerusalem to the outskirts of town, outside the city wall, over to Golgotha, which wasn't far for more Jesus had been buried in that new but borrowed tomb. The sun's now coming up and as they near the tomb, they're thinking, who's going to roll the stone away from the door of the tomb for us? That's actually a, a really good thought because that stone was huge. See, the tomb was a rock tomb. And in front of the mouth of the tomb was this channel that was on an incline so that the large circular stone could be rolled down that channel, cover the opening of the tomb, and settle into its final resting spot, making it nearly impossible to roll away. One said that because of the size of the stone and in the way it was settled over the mouth of the tomb, that 20 men couldn't roll it away. So the women's concern about the stone was a very real concern. And yet they proceeded, carried along by their tender mission of finishing the preparations for burial of the body of Christ. An act of love. Look what happened next, verses 4 and 5. When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. Entering into the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. So look, the second event of resurrection morning was that the stone was rolled away. Verse 4, say what? Say what? That, that, that massive stone was, was rolled away. How? <laughs> what happened? Who did this? Other Gospels tell us that as the women were coming to the tomb, that there was an earthquake. And the earth quaked because an angel came down. And it was the angel that not only petrified the soldiers guarding the tomb, but who also rolled that stone away. Not to let Christ out of the tomb, no, but to let the women coming to see it into the tomb. The women probably felt the earthquake, but at this point, they didn't know why it quaked. And as they came to where the tomb was at, they were shocked to see that that stone had been rolled away. Now, the guards at this point, evidently, after their initial debilitating fear of seeing that angel, they'd gone off to tell the authorities about this most staggering event. And it was not long after that that these women arrived. What do you think they were feeling at that point? Stones rolled away. What's going on? What's happening? Think about that. The stones rolled away. You picture them looking up and seeing this? Can you picture them inching their way closer to the tomb, going up to the tomb, entering into the tomb, and then looking to the right, 
and seeing a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting there. Picture it. It's amazing. I mean, who was he? Other gospels tell us that it was an angel and he scared these women to death. (laughs) They were utterly terrified by what they saw. Luke's gospel tells us that there were actually two angels who were here at the tomb. But Mark focuses in on the one who spoke. And notice this, the body was gone. The body wasn't there. The grave clothes were there and the angels were there and the women were there, but the body of Christ was missing. Where did it go? I mean, the tomb was empty, right? That's a fact. The tomb was empty. So what happened to the body? Now, sadly, the unsaved and unbelieving world does their best to explain away the resurrection of Christ. Throughout the years, people have come up with many theories to explain this away. They've come up with one theory called the swoon theory to explain away the empty tomb. The theory says that Christ never really died, but he only faked it. (laughs) He only swooned on the cross, and instead of dying, he went into a semi-coma because of all the suffering that he'd already been through. And because of this semi-coma, the people assumed that he was dead, and then they put him in the tomb, and it was there in the tomb that Jesus suddenly revived because of the spices that he had been anointed with, and also because of the coolness of the tomb. So he woke up there in the tomb, and his disciples had assumed that he had risen from the dead because he was now alive. So think about that. How dumb. (laughs) Think about that. He successfully survived the beating and the scourging prior to the cross. He survived the crucifixion. He survived the spear being rammed into him, which proved that he was dead. He survived being entombed. He survived in that condition three days with no food or water. He woke up without medical help, having lost most of his blood. And then he moved the stone away. He chased off the Romans who were guarding his tomb. And he convinced everyone that he was a risen Lord. Okay. (laughs) It's a real theory. Another theory is called the no burial theory. The theory says that the reason they didn't find him when they went to the tomb is because he was never really put there. Instead, they, they took him off the cross and they threw his body into the city dump where they threw the corpses of criminals. So they say he wasn't there in the tomb on Sunday because he hadn't been put there on Friday. But question, why did the leaders want the tomb sealed and guarded if nobody was in it? And why did they ask the Romans to guard it if it was empty? I mean, it doesn't make sense. You also have the hallucination theory that says that he never really did come out of the tomb. Instead, the people thought that they saw Jesus because they wanted to see him so badly that they actualized him in some kind of mental image that they thought was reality. Okay. Or this, the telepathy theory. This says that there was no physical resurrection, but that God sent back mental images to the disciples so that they would think that Christ was alive. Okay, or this, the seance theory. It's getting better, right? This theory says that a medium conjured up the spirit of the dead Jesus by occult power. Or this, the mistaken identity theory. This one's a good one. That says that someone impersonated Jesus. This theory says that Jesus actually had an identical twin named Hiram. This is what they say. Hiram was separated from Jesus at birth and he didn't meet up with Jesus again until Christ's crucifixion in Jerusalem. Hiram stumbled into Jerusalem on that terrible day. He saw the death of his twin on the cross and then he stole Jesus' body from the tomb and then he impersonated Jesus and he fooled everyone. Okay. Or this. Jesus was crucified with two people. He took snake poison to fake his death. Upon recovering, he married Mary Magdalene, and then later on, he fell in love with Lydia of Philippi. That's a theory. That, how sick. How sick. Or this, the disciples stole the body. They came, they somehow got past the Roman guard, the seal rolled the stone away, and they stole the body. There's no way they really could have done that, and even if they could have, would they have done that? For a lie that they knew was a lie that they gave their lives for? I mean, would they really allow themselves to be persecuted, ridiculed, scourged, and put to death for a lie? One writer says, not one of them ever expressed the least doubt of the reality of the resurrection. They endured everything rather than deny that they had seen him. They had no motive in doing this but the love of the truth. They obtained no wealth by it, no honor, no pleasure. They gave themselves up to great and unparalleled sufferings, going from land to land, crossing almost every sea, and enduring the dangers, toils, and privations of almost every kind for the simple object of affirming everywhere that a Savior died and rose from the dead. 
Do men conduct themselves in this way for nothing? When they know that it's nothing. No, they don't. Come on. Everybody knows that the body wasn't stolen. Why do I say that? Because in Matthew 28, 11, it says that the soldiers who had been guarding the tomb after the angel came down and Jesus resurrected from the dead, they came into the city and reported to the chief priest what had happened. But look, instead of believing it, the religious leaders immediately sought how they could discredit it. That's what sin does, right? That's what sin does. They would rather bribe soldiers and spread a lie than believe the truth. The truth that can save their soul. Look, the case for the empty tomb is strong, obviously. But that doesn't matter for most people. They simply don't want to surrender to the Lord. I mean, the historical data shows that Jesus was a real person who walked this earth. That isn't in question. The facts also show that Jesus did indeed suffer and die. And both liberal and conservative scholars confirm that Jesus did indeed die that he was buried in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, and that his death drove his disciples to despair. That's all historically true. It's also a fact that the New Testament has stronger manuscript support than any other work of classical literature, that it's indeed reliable, and that the other writings of the time back up what the Bible claims. On top of that is a historical fact that the tomb of Christ was empty. Not only that, but we also have the appearances of Christ after his resurrection. And it's very clear that the apostles were absolutely positive that Jesus had appeared to them in the flesh. They believed it. They were transformed from being cowards into martyrs. They saw him alive and their lives were changed forever because of it. Interesting that in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, Paul says that Christ appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Most of them who are still alive though some have fallen asleep. And here, Paul is telling the Corinthian readers that if you doubt, then go ahead and ask the hundreds of eyewitnesses. Examine them. Hear their firsthand accounts. Now, it's one thing to back this up with people who are already dead, but it's another thing to attribute its reality to multitudes of people who are still alive, and that's exactly what Paul did. One professor sums this thought up with these words. The more we study the tradition with regard to the appearances, the firmer the rock begins to appear upon which they are based. Yeah, of course. Spurgeon said that the resurrection of Christ is a fact better attested than any event recorded in history. And he's right. The tomb was empty. Meaning that while the angels were there and while the women were there, who wasn't there? Jesus wasn't there. Look what happened next, verses 6 through 8. He said to them, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He's risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and they were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. So look. The third event of resurrection morning was that the news was given, he is risen. Okay, that was pretty good. Pretty good. (laughs) That was okay. Can you imagine not only seeing two angels, but hearing one of them talk? Mark, again, mentions that the one who spoke, but there were indeed two of them. Other accounts of this event tell us that their garments were white as snow and that they were shining. Why? Because God is perfectly holy. And these angels reflect that holiness even in what they wear, much like how Moses' face radiated the Shekinah glory of God after he had been with the Lord. And here we find that these angels are just radiating the glory and holiness of God even with their garments. Result, fear. Great fear, which is the natural and proper response to seeing an angel or two from the Lord. Don't be alarmed. Okay, well, thanks, angel. But even though you say that, I'm still a bit alarmed, right? You, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. Yeah, that's right. That's, we saw it. We, we were there. We saw his crushed body. We saw his blood. We saw him hang. We, we saw him die. And we are indeed seeking his dead corpse. That's correct. Guess what? He's risen. He's not here. Say what, angel? Luke's account tells us that the angel also said, 
Why do you seek the living among the dead? I love that. I mean, hey, what are you guys doing here? They're in the tomb looking for a dead man, but the grave is no place to find the Lord who's alive. Why are you looking for the resurrected Lord here in this tomb? It's a good question. Don't we still do this today? Think about it. We serve a risen Lord. Think about that. We serve a victorious Lord. We serve a Lord who gives us every, every reason in the world to be joyful and to live with passion and to redeem the time. And yet, how many of us are living like we're dead in a graveyard? We live like we serve a dead Savior, like we have no reason to be filled with joy, like this life is all that there is, like we don't have heaven waiting for us, like we don't have a a good God that we're soon going to see face to face in eternal glory. Come on, snap out of it. Christ is risen, and you can do it again. Come on, right? Snap out of it. Stop living like the rest of the world who's dead and without hope. No, live like you have a good God to glorify and just a little time left to do it here. We are forgiven. Stop wallowing around in sin. We have heaven as our inheritance. Stop living like you have no hope. (laughs) We can impact eternity by the way that we live today. Stop living like the world without Christ and without his amazing grace that saves. The world is dead and is heading for hell, but not so us in Christ. Not so us. And that fact should show in how we live Everything around us is going to die and and fade away, but the things of God last forever. So let's not set our hearts here on this graveyard. No, let's set our hearts on the Lord who is victorious and let's live like we believe it. Why? Because Jesus isn't dead. He is alive. He's not here. But these are some of the most beautiful and important words ever spoken by an angel to a person. He's not here. How good is that? In Israel, there is an ocean of tombs on the Mount of Olives and outside the eastern wall of the Temple Mount. Graves are everywhere. Guess what? All those graves are filled with bodies and bones, but not the tomb of Jesus. No, guess what? That one is empty. You can actually go into the garden tomb, and you won't find the body there. No, he's risen. He is not here. I love how the angel said, see the place where they laid him? As he points to the grave clothes that are empty of a body. See, he's alive. And that is significant. It literally means everything, everything for us in Christ. Can I say it again? Everything. Everything. And now, everything that would be true if Jesus hasn't risen from the dead is now turned upside down. Jesus is indeed God the Son who conquers death. What he did on the cross for believers is a reality because the resurrection proves it. Because he lives and was victorious, so too will we who believe live and be eternally victorious in him. And so today we can celebrate the fact that our preaching isn't worthless, no, but it has eternal value. And because Jesus rose, then the message that we preach is powerful and it's effective and it's true and it won't return void and it saves and it convicts and it pierces and it has value for all eternity. And today you can stand up and say, hey, I have good news for you and it really is good soul-saving news. And we can celebrate the fact that our faith has eternal value. Jesus rose again and proved that he had power over sin, death, and the devil, that he was God, his words were true, and he was and is our only Lord and our only Savior. And we don't follow a a dead man who's buried in the ground somewhere like so many other false religions. We serve the true God. We follow a risen Lord. And when we believe and love this risen Lord, we can have his hope and his joy and his peace, and his love, and his mercy, and his grace, and his forgiveness, and the eternal life that comes through him. And we can celebrate today the fact that we are true witnesses of Christ instead of false witnesses. See, we're not liars. We're not following a lie. We're not following a Savior who lied about who he was. No, we're following the truth, and we're seeking to tell everyone we can about this truth that can save their lost souls. It's true. Jesus is God. It's true. Jesus came to this earth to die for sinners like us. It's true. God poured out his wrath against the believer's sin onto Christ. It's true. Jesus suffered and died to pay the penalty that you deserve. It's true. Jesus rose up from the dead. And because he rose from the dead, we too can defeat sin and death and have eternal life through him, through faith in him, because of his amazing grace. It's true. 
And, amen. And we can serve, we can celebrate today because we who believe, we are forgiven of all of our wretched sin that condemns us to hell. And everything that Jesus did on the cross on Friday was a reality. And because of the cross and because of the resurrection, our sins have been washed clean. Our sins have been covered up and paid for in full by Christ. We stand forgiven right now of all our sin that once condemned us and the forgiveness of sin that we so desperately need to get to heaven that we so desperately need is a reality for us in Christ and that is the best news there is. And today we can celebrate because all the believers who have gone on before us, they're in heaven. And, and when we get to heaven, guess what? We're going to see him. Peter, Paul, Moses, our many loved ones who have gone on before us, who love the Lord, they're all in heaven instead of hell because Jesus rose up from the dead, giving us the victory through him who conquered sin and death. And now for us in Christ, our death is going to be our best day, not our worst day. And today we can celebrate because instead of being pitied by the world, we stand victorious in Christ. And because we're children of the living God, we too will defeat death and live forever in heaven in the presence of the God who loves us. And all the pains and hurts and struggles and trials of this fading life will be swallowed up in sweet, eternal victory. Yeah, I'd say the resurrection of Christ is kind of important. And we have every reason in the world to celebrate today. Look. The angels then reminded the women to go and tell Christ's disciples and Peter the good news. Isn't that good? And Peter. Why single Peter out? Because the last time Peter was seen, he was denying Christ with cursing and swearing. You think Peter needed to hear this good news? Right? And doesn't this show us the amazing mercy, grace, and love of our good God? Make sure Peter knows. I haven't cast him out because of his sin and his failing. Make sure Peter knows that he's still my disciple. That's so good. You ever fail big time? You ever mess up? You ever let God down by, by sinning, by being a coward, by just blowing it? Hey, he won't cast you out. No, he loves his erring children, and he's always ready to extend mercy for those who seek it. Let the disciples know, and Peter, what? that Jesus is going before you into Galilee and there you'll see him just as he said to you. Jesus already said back in chapter 14, verse 28 of Mark, after I've been raised up, I'll go ahead of you into Galilee. But they'd forgotten or else they didn't really believe it. And so the angel reminds them again, Jesus is going to meet you in Galilee. Jesus is going to appear to you in Galilee. So go tell the disciples to head up north and go to Galilee. Guess what? They didn't go there. <laughs> Not for a while at least. But they did eventually go north to Galilee after Jesus appeared to them a few more times in Jerusalem. But now, these women have a mission, don't they? Tell the disciples the good news. Right? What a mission. What a mission. The fourth event of resurrection morning is that the women fled and were amazed and they were also afraid at the same time. Verse 8 says that they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. But we know from other Gospels that that fear wore off and it melted into a joy and into an excitement over what they had heard. So they came out of it, they came out of it, and then they ran to report the good news. And that's when Jesus first appeared to them according to Matthew's account. From the other Gospel accounts, we know that Mary Magdalene returned to the tomb and she saw Jesus. And guess what? He's alive and he's well. Can you imagine? Later the same day, Jesus appeared to Peter. Still on the same day, Jesus appeared to Cleopas and another disciple on their way to Emmaus. Jesus went on and appeared to 10 of the disciples with Thomas missing. Jesus then appeared to all 11 disciples with Thomas included. After that, Jesus appeared to seven disciples by the Sea of Galilee and he made breakfast for them. Jesus went on and appeared to about 500 disciples in Galilee. He appeared to his half-brother James. He then commissioned his disciples. He went on to teach his disciples the scriptures and he promised to send the Holy Spirit. And then they watched him as he ascended up into heaven. Yeah, he's definitely alive. He is risen from the dead. So what should our response be this morning to this incredible news? Well, how about awe? and amazement. How about that? Like, like the women were. Jesus should amaze us all. 
Every day. Every day. The word for amazed in verse 8 is the Greek word ecstasis, from which we get our English word ecstatic. It means to be astounded, and I quote, with a big astonishment. It means to be intensely amazed and to be beside yourself with wonder, with a little bit of reverential fear mixed into that. And like with these women, Jesus, our risen Savior, should do this to us every day. I mean, every day. Think about it. God the Son became a man, never ceasing to be God. What? (laughs) No way. No way. Jesus lived a perfect life so he could suffer and die on a cross to rescue sinners like us from eternal wrath. No way. God did that for me? No way. Jesus let his own creation spit on him, mock him, brutalize him, murder him to save us. What kind of God does that? Jesus faced hell so we who believe wouldn't have to. What? For us? Yeah. Jesus faced God's wrath against your sin so rebels like us could be saved and be with him forever. Are you not amazed yet? Jesus suffered and died. And then three days later, he rose up from the dead, proving who he was, proving that what he did on that cross was a reality and ensuring the eternal victory for all who believe in him when he didn't have to do any of it. No, love compelled him, though. How can we be indifferent to that? How can we not help but be filled to the brim with love for Jesus, our Lord, our beloved, in light of all this? Come on. We should be in a constant state of amazement. We should be in a constant state of awe at our Jesus that should then fill us with love and passion to honor this God who died to make us his. To honor this God who did all this to rescue us. Us, you, me. And Mark wants us to grasp that fact. Look at Jesus. Look at who he is. Look at what he did to save your desperate soul. And now... As the saved by grace through faith in him, go out and live like it, right? Go out and change the world with the short time that you have left. Go out and fight the good fight. Go out and spread the good news to the dying world around you. The good news that Jesus can change your life for all eternity and rescue your soul and give you heaven instead of hell. Anybody? Go out and tell it. He's risen. Amen. See, our Savior is alive and well. He's not dead in that old cold tomb. No, he conquered sin. He conquered death. He won the victory. And we are victorious along with him as believers. Let's remember this today. And let's live in light of this most incredible reality. No wonder that Peter exclaims, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, 1 Peter 1, 3. So today, come on, today is a great day for us. Anybody? It's a great day. Oh, trumpet sound, the victory call, and tongues proclaim good news for all. He's risen, he's risen. Oh, let a thousand hymns break forth, proclaiming our Redeemer's worth. He's risen. He who was slain on our behalf, suffering beneath his Father's wrath. He's risen, he's risen. He who was hung upon the tree rose from the tomb in victory. He's risen. Oh, Christian, are you filled with gloom? Then look inside the empty tomb. He's risen. He's risen. Here there is hope for every fear. Here there is joy for every tear. He is risen. Amen? He's risen. So let's celebrate our risen, victorious Lord today. It's a great day. It's a great day for all of us in Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this incredible news. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you for the gospel and what that means to undeserving rebels like us. Help us now, Lord, to go out and stand in awe of you, to be amazed, to be filled with love, and to go and tell so that others can know this soul-saving truth. We love you. We thank you. I pray that you would bless us this day as we go out and celebrate you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.